Welcome to episode six of Rail Talk. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds. And John, no snark this week. It was just great to see you and Patty and the whole team last week. And shout out to everybody who stopped us, asked about the show, subscribed, tell a friend to tell a friend. We had a great time being there at Face It. No doubt about that, Joe. It really was a lot of fun. And people were actually stopping us on the street, which was really cool. Um, usually when I get stopped on the street, I get nervous. Like, what did I just do? But people were stopping and then, you know, basically they weren't asking for autographs yet, but they were definitely, uh, you know, high fiving us and slapping hands. And it was it was a good time. Oh, Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. Um, and uh, welcome to episode six already. Wow. Half dozen, baby. Uh, you know, in this show, we like to have fun. We like, we like to crack jokes. So we like to keep it loose um, and have guests on and tell stories and make fun of each other a little bit. And John and I will make fun of each other a little bit later in the show. Um, but there there are certain weeks in racing where it just doesn't feel appropriate to do that. And this is for sure one of those weeks. Um, so we're not going to have a guest today. Uh, John and I are just going to have a little therapy session. For, for what happened over the weekend. And then later we will talk some racing. We'll talk the basic sales because they're, they're worth some really good storylines from over the weekend in the last couple of days. But everything, every discussion, I think of the Saratoga meet so far, not just this weekend, has to begin with what happened with Maple Leaf Mel on Saturday in the test stakes. Um, I'm sure you've seen it, but if you haven't seen it or, or heard about it, um, Maple Leaf Mel, who is undefeated, New York bred, um, Named after her trainer, Melanie Gidd Giddings. The two were very, very close. There was a great Naira feature about them before the race. Uh, she was about to win the test and stay six for six and undefeated. And she was much the best. And she unfortunately broke down a couple of strides before the wire. Now, I'm going to toss it to John in just a second because he was there. And that was like, I, I was just, you know, I, to, just to be selfish, I was very thankful that I wasn't there for that because. That's honestly the worst thing I've ever seen in racing. Like it was, in, you know, considering the context, considering the horse, considering the 40 plus thousand people there were at Saratoga that day, beautiful Saturday, Whitney day. I mean, it just, it doesn't get any worse than that. And there, there's, there's no timeline. There's no timeline that you have for, to be able to grieve over things like this. You know, it affects everybody very, very deeply, but I know it affected the people that were there that day the most, uh, John. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, and, and and Joe, we were we were lucky in the sense that um, our credentials allowed us to get into the paddock for the test um, because we were in the next stake race. So so you know, my dad and I and 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 a few of our friends um, kind of stood off to the side in the paddock, and and because Maple Leaf Mel is owned by Coach Parcells um, and is a daughter of Cross Traffic, and obviously we have. A great affinity for cross traffic. Um, you know, I wanted to see her up close and personal because I, I had never laid eyes on her. And, and of course she was a beautiful filly and, um, and, and, uh, you know, like you said, was, was 10 yards away from winning. And, you know, there's an old superstition in, in racing about how you never, you never celebrate until you pass the wire. And I never really understood that because, you know, sometimes horses get caught at the wire, but I, I've never in 40 years seen, um, you know, witnessed either on tape or live uh, a horse that was going to win a grade one and, you know, what happened to her uh, going down. And, and you know, horses are, are, are flight animals. So even when she went down, I'm not going to get too graphic, but she tried to get up and, and run more um, and, and couldn't. And um, it, it was it just it, I've never, ever heard 40,000 people hush like it was at the racetrack. You could hear a pin drop um, all throughout the, the uh, you know, the, the course and, and the stands. And, you know, we were in the next race. And, and even, Joe, even talking about it right now, like, like there's, a, there's a lump in my throat. It, 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 you know, it feels like somebody kicked me in the stomach. It's just, it's horrifying. And, and it almost doesn't matter the, how good she was. Um, you know, obviously that adds to the story and the fact that it was a grade one um, and so many firsts that were going to occur for, you know, for that for that potential win. Um, but but it was it was it was hard. It was hard to to be in, in the paddock. It was hard to be there and witness it. Um, and I didn't even own the horse. But just as a fellow owner, it, my heart went out to them. And, um, 
you know, it, it also changed the way we thought about things, Joe. We we had a whole strategy to tell our rider for Web Slinger. And, and instead of telling him the strategy, we just said, come home safe. And, and that's not necessarily something that, that we ever thought about. I mean, you always want your, your animal, your athlete, and, and your jockey to come back safely. Um, but you never think it's going to happen in, a, in, you know, in such a prestigious race at, at Saratoga, which is such a prestigious racetrack. Um, it, but it, 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 it bothered my dad and I enough where, um, you know, we opted not to buy any yearlings at the sale because we just didn't have it. We just didn't have it in us to walk around and 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 look and shortlist and look at a lot of yearlings. It's just the the, the joy of 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 pre sale and everything like that just kind of left us um, and, and greatly affected us. And 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 I'm not saying that we were noble in doing that. I, I think more Brendan Walsh and uh, and and the owners and Tyler definitely own that the rider of of the horse that won were noble in in not accepting the trophy not having a celebration in the winner circle uh and and to me that that was just incredible you know that that that's how much it affected everybody they won a grade one race and they and they just didn't feel like it was the right time to celebrate yeah and you know that, that's something i'm going to get to which is the, the outpouring of support particularly um i think we can we can throw up a photo or, or a tweet of this on the screen right now, the, uh, the Brennan Walsh and his assistant trainer brought the the garland of flowers that is given to the test winner to Maple Leaf Mel's stall, and that like that shit broke my heart, man. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. that empty stall with those with the flowers hanging on them, like her purple ball that she would play with, and all the pictures and everything, like yeah. That shit wrecked me, man. Yeah, and and it was a really classy move by them to to do it. Um, and, and Joe, unfortunately, Maple Leaf Mel wasn't the only one who broke down that weekend. Yeah, um, you know, every summer, um, you know, a, a, a filly who who also uh, you know was was up and and a potential you know really top horse um, had just finished you know placed in a graded stake race. Um, and and I think if I remember correctly, I think. Grand Motion had a filly that 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 died on the racetrack, and there was another horse that allegedly broke down on the Oklahoma uh, back in at Oklahoma as well. And it, it was just it was it was a combination of of just a bunch of gut punches um, for the industry. And and you know a lot of people stepped up, which I was really pleased to see. A lot of people um, you know did what they could to try to try to uh, make it better. Um, and in a, in a very soothing and, and classy way, but just like the emotion you're showing right now, I, I mean, it, we love the sport. We, you know, and, and we have a passion for the sport, but at the end of the day, it's the athletes, it's the horses that mean the most. And, and when you have a significant um, rash of breakdowns like Saratoga did, uh, you know, you, there's, there's a lot of questions in my mind as far as what can they do to make it safer? And I know you and I always champion that about, you know, trying to make things safer and better. And, and, and if, if there wasn't a signature moment for that, um, this weekend, I, I don't know when there will be. Yeah. And it's, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make this into like a big horse safety thing, you know, because I, that was like some of the, you know, I, this is one of the things I hate. And it comes from having a defensive posture about the sport is that every time there's like a high profile breakdown, it's like the, the response from a lot of people is, oh, well, the PETA folks are going to have a field day with this. Like, I don't care. I honestly do not care. Like, this is this is about those Phillies losing their lives and all the people that they they affected and they touched right. and what they have to go through now. Yeah. But that other, all that other stuff. It's going to happen without us. You know, all the noise, it's not about that. And I don't want to make this into a thing about, you know, how safe Saratoga is or whatever, because we all know that this stuff can pop up out of nowhere with no explanation whatsoever. Now, there is some talk about the turf course, and we, that was that was where two of the horses broke down. So that's a discussion that can be had, how safe, safe is a turf course. But, the, I mean, it's just it's just one of those things, and it, it, it sucks that it, and it happened in front of so many people. But like you said, John, it – Anytime it happens for any horse, it's it, it's something that, that has to be fixed. And it's not I'm not saying that the industry is hasn't made huge strides on this. And I don't want to make this like a like I said, a broad conversation about that. But, you know, we always we always have to do better. And unfortunately, 
sometimes stuff stuff like this blows up in our faces, but it's not on, it's not woe is us. The 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 hardship is born by that Philly and the connections. And right. you know that this is like the test will, ne- will never be the same. Like the test w- that will be remembered forever. Saratoga to a certain extent will never be the same. The same way that Belmont was never the same after Bel- after Ruffian broke down and after Go for One broke down like Belmont was never the same after that and especially if you were you were there that day um and it's you know the sport will will rip your heart out and it'll make you question as you're saying John it's like sometimes whether or not it's it's all worth it you know I it, it I'm usually stoked to come up here to Saratoga can't wait to go to the track it sucked the enthusiasm out of it for me yeah. and it's just it, it's it's a devastating loss for the industry and I, I will say that the outpouring of support for Melanie Giddings, for Maple Leaf Mel, and I think there should be the same support to the Clement Stable for Ever Summer and everybody who works with those with that who worked with that Philly and Graham Motion and Sopran Basilia and everybody who worked with that Philly. Like all we can do, we can't worry about what Pete is going to say or what this means for the industry. All we can do is support the people in their time of need and. Those people are, they need our, our support and our love and our grace right now. So that's, that's all this is about for me at this point. So we're definitely not going to stop talking about that. And if anybody reaches out, wants to reach out or have any comments or come on the show to talk about this weekend and how it affected them, you are more than welcome. Please pull up and, and talk to us. But we do want to talk a little bit about the, the rest of the, the racing weekend, which was highlighted by the Whitney Stakes. Uh, you know, John, this was this was another one that was like kind of hard for me to feel good about. You know, even though I like White Barrio and I bet him a bunch, did not bet him on Saturday though. Um, you know, there's obviously the the trickiness and the the ickiness of Rick Dutro winning the Whitney coming off a 10 year suspension. Now, I will say he served he served his time. He's one of the few guys. I'm not saying he didn't deserve it. He's one of the few guys who got a real long beefy sentence for drug violations and breaking rules he served his time you can we can debate about whether or not he deserves to still be in the game whether or not he could have gotten a lifetime ban should have gotten a lifetime ban but it was i don't know i and i I don't want to judge him going forward if he stays clean from here on out great that'd be awesome but john for a likable horse and a big performance ran a 110 buyer didn't feel that great did it (laughs) <laughs> no, it, 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 you know, the feel good story, of course, would have been if Cody's wish had won, um, you know, because the family was there and, and, and we were fortunate enough to have lunch with um, Kate Galvin from Darley Godolphin a couple of days later. And uh, ultimately, Cody's wish is obviously going to stand at stud um, at, at Darley. And, um, it, you know, it just would have made like a Disney-esque type result if, if, if Cody had, had won. Uh, you know, the Whitney as well. But White Barrio really ran everyone off their feet at 10 to 1 and, and won, you know, easily in a hand ride by, by six lengths. Um, despite that fact, Irad, um, you know, rode three horses in that race again, um, was, was all, over, all over the place again. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's another therapy session, as we say, you know, what, what's going on up there. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it was a small field, Joe, um, in, the, in the Whitney. There were only six. Uh, but I would think there was four legitimate horses in the race. And uh, even though sentimentally everyone was rooting for Cody's wish, uh, ultimately that day, White Barrio was the best horse. Yeah, and that, that doesn't mean Cody's wish isn't great. You know, right. it's like even if he, can, if he can't go two turns, I don't know if he can't go two, two turns. He couldn't do it on Saturday. But even if he can't do that, he's still an awesome horse who's had a horse of the year type campaign. Question is, that now as soon they cut back and run in the dirt mile instead of the classic, does he win horse of the year if someone else jumps up and wins the classic who's already won, you know, a, a grade one or two uh, this year? Uh, Jim, what, what if Forte what if Forte wins? What if Forte wins the classic? Is he horse of the year? Not if he doesn't win something big in between now and then. Because he's he's only Fair. to me to me he's only got the one he's got the one grade one win in the Florida mm-hmm. Derby. He was a good second in the Belmont, but he didn't win. I mean, he's up there, you know, he's he's definitely one of the top three or four choices right now. But I, I want to see him finish out the year with another win. And then if he wins in the classic, then, yeah, hell yeah, he's he's horse of the year. Right. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about Saratoga in a second. But I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, the Colonial Downs 
which is this year's rotating host of the Arlington Million. Maybe, maybe next year we're going to do it at Lone Star Park or, uh, yeah, who knows? But, your, your, your favorite track, Mammoth Park? Yeah, I'm, I would be there. And I'm going to be there Saturday at Colonial Downs. Yeah, my oh, first excellent. time ever at Colonial, if they can squeeze me on the plane, because um, West Point has Northern Invader running in the Secretariat Stakes. Super, super exciting horse. Um, I was there. He broke his maiden by eight lengths on the Belmont turf going a mile last month. We had 94 buyer, so he's pretty scary. But we have the Secretariat, the Beverly D, and the Arlington Million. There used to be a fourth race, didn't there, John? There was no. usually another great stakes race. But I'm excited yeah. about that because I, I like the Colonial turf course, you know, big fields for the most part. And with all the issues that the Churchill Downs turf course has been having, Brady, I think it's a pretty sound decision to run it at Colonial. So I'm looking forward to being there for the first time. But I want to jump back to Saratoga for a second because, you know, John, you've noticed this. Anybody who's been watching the meet has noticed this. It seems like a very snake bitten meet. Yeah. You know, we had so we've had that we've had the cancellations. We've had the ton of races coming off the turf um, because of, of the rain. Obviously, we had tragically what happened over the weekend. And today we had a power outage at Saratoga. And I was only a delay. I think they were able to, to complete the card. John, have you do you remember a weirder Saratoga meet than this? No, it, you know, you, you look at it and you see the rain outs and the excessive heat and the loss of power and and some horses, uh, you know, uh, dying on on the track. Um, and and you just you scratch your head and you say snake bit is the exact term I was going to use, Joe. I mean, that, that that exactly falls into it. I mean, you're, you're waiting for locusts and frogs to, to come in, you know, and uh, it, it, it's just that kind of a biblical kind of issue. Um, and, and it's no wonder why that by the turf course is, you know, as chopped up as it is. And it, look. I think that Naira was in a very difficult position. It was it was a perfect no pun intended. It was a perfect storm of issues that occurred um, as to why they ultimately had to you know take the race off the turf. And and you'd know better than I would as far as how it affected the betters, um, you know, for those couple of races. But they they canceled racing, um, you know, two uh, on on Saturday, two races after uh, after the test. And, uh, and, and I think they're trying to do the right thing. I think they're trying to make it as safe as possible and, and walking the turf course. But, you know, one of the reasons why people come to Saratoga is to run in the big turf races and, and to run in the, the graded races, especially with Gulfstream not having turf this, this summer um, and some of the racetracks also getting hit with weather and, and having delays and cancellations on the turf. So, you know, everyone brought their great horses to, to, to Saratoga for, for turf racing, and it's just been a cluster. And, it, and it's really I, I think a lot of it is out of their hands. I think a lot of it is, is no fault of their own. It, it, it's, you know, it, 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 whatever whatever weather God you believe in um, is affecting the, the races. But um, snake bit is absolutely the right thing because they've hit every single weather issue short of a tornado. Yeah, um, we, we hope things clear up because obviously we love being at Saratoga and, you know, it's pretty much the best product. I mean, Del Mar's had a great product this this meet this summer, but usually Saratoga pretty much the best product in America from a betting standpoint. But right. not when they do what they did to the betters on Sunday because that was a major, major issue. No one, no one's complaining, or nobody I saw at least, was complaining about them taking the races off the turf, especially after what happened earlier in the card. And there was just, you, you could watch the races and even for horses that didn't pull up or, or break down, there were some funny steps going on, especially in the oh, yeah. stretch of those turf races. And the turf course had taken a ton of rain in the previous few days. And they had they had been running races during that time because they had a lot of big stakes on those cards. So it's like, obviously, you want to do everything you can to get those races in and not have to reschedule. But it, you could tell something was not right with that footing. So they did the right thing, 100%, taking the races off the turf. They're off the turf today, recording on Wednesday. We'll see if they're on for the rest of the week. Um, but they... If you haven't if you haven't seen it, they took the races off the turf. It was a couple minutes before the start of the late pick five, I think like three minutes to post. And those they ran the race. Those turf races that were scheduled became all races, which if you're not familiar, means you get every horse in the race, no matter who you use, is a winner because they're giving you the benefit. Usually it's a good thing. Usually it's a protection for betters. If some rain comes halfway through a right. sequence and knocks the races off the grass, it's right. so that you can still cash, even if a horse that you didn't pick, you know, wins because the race is on a different surface. And Joe, but if I remember you, correctly, just to interrupt you for a second, if I remember correctly, yeah. It used to be where if there was an issue like that and they and, and you know they, they had to change surface, you would get the, the betting favorite 
as your as your key. So they did improve it. They improved it to give you instead of one horse, you get you get all. I, no, I think yeah. that was a positive thing. No, for sure. In general, it's a, it's a le- level of protection for the betters that's very appreciated. On the other hand, when you do it three minutes before the race, it depresses the payout to where there, there were only two dirt races in the sequence. There were three turf races. So the race essentially became a daily double and paid like $25. Now, obviously, if you have all and you use multiple horses, you get a bunch of those tickets. But it, it completely kills the ability to make a big score because pretty much everyone is going to hit it. So obviously unacceptable. I saw David O'Rourke issued an apology today. So, yeah. uh, you know, a couple I of days. I thought it was great. I thought, I thought that was a great decision by him to get in front yeah, of no. them. Some would say a couple of days late, but I thought, you know, appropriate. And, right. you know, he did the right thing. And it's just it's just one of those things in racing. And, I, and I, I'm not picking on Naira because I've seen this happen at a bunch of other tracks. It's just such an easily it, – it's just don't step on this rake. You know what I mean? Like this is such an easy pitfall to avoid. Like – and Naira delays post times all the time. They did it today for the power outage. They do it for rain all the time. Sometimes they speed up post times right. to try to avoid rain. There was absolutely no reason they couldn't call an audible. Someone call down and say, we're going to delay this post time and the rest of the post times for an extra 15 minutes so betters are able to adjust their tickets. Just that, that gesture in itself would do so much in terms of goodwill from the track and from the organization to the betters, because we don't ask for much, you know? Takeouts high, fields are small, stewards' rulings are capricious and arbitrary. We do not ask for much. Much We're used to getting kicked in the balls if we're a horse player, but just don't do this easily avoidable, disrespectful stuff to us. And if you do, you should apologize, but just it's, it's an easy thing to avoid. Just anytime there's a late change like that, when in doubt, delay the post time and people will be able to adjust their tickets. It's the right, right. thing to do. Yeah. And, and again, Joe, it wasn't like it was a two-year-old race where, where the horses, you know, it's a bad experience if you have to delay because they get very antsy or if they are already in the starting gate and have to get backed out. Um, it, it's, you know, for young horses, it gets really screwy for them. Um, it, 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 that wasn't the case. I, I will say again, not to defend, you know, not, not to defend management here, but um, there was another plague that was beset upon them uh, where most of the, I don't know if you realize this, but most of the racing office got COVID um, and they were out for the majority of, of the week. I, David O'Rourke and, and a lot of people in the office weren't even there on Whitney Day um, because, because they were, they were infirmed. They were sick from, from COVID. So, yeah. you know, I don't know who was in charge that day, um, or who could have made the decision that day. But I, I think that, that, you know, just the human aspect of it, the decision maker may not have been there. Yeah, I mean, you're supposed to have layers of leadership there. But yes, now I definitely feel worse for trashing them. No, they're <laughs> yeah. all sick of COVID. Thank you for springing that on the end of my long rant, John. Like such a such a team player under COVID. Well, wait, I, I still remember last week where you were like, oh, I set him up. Uh, oh, He always, he always gets me back, even Steve over here. All right, good. <laughs> I, I actually didn't think of it until just now. <laughs> like, yeah, they're in the hospital bed with COVID. <laughs> and I'm like, David O'Rourke should burn now. David O'Rourke was, was getting, getting an IV as, as the Whitney was going on. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't even bring up that web slinger, uh, another plague, another snake bit. We lost in a photo for the, yeah. uh, you know, for yeah. the, for the Saratoga. Cause you know, this show is all about me. You do realize that everything is about. So I mean, yeah. he had every chance to go by. Him. He did. He did have every chance to go by. There's no question about it. Rail talk is proudly sponsored by facing Tipton. Facing Tipton. A little busy this weekend. I don't even know what all the foot traffic was about, but uh, it seemed to be a lot of people around those, those sales grounds. I mean, yeah, facing tip to Saratoga, you expect fireworks, and then you get even more fireworks. It's a great party. This was my first time at the facing Saratoga sale. I've been to the New York Red sale. I've been to a couple other sales. Never at the facing Saratoga sale, and I get it. I get why people love it and why people get hopped up and spend big money on horses. And it's just it's it's such a lively atmosphere. Um, and just having it be at night and just the, the quality of the yearlings. So shout out to Facebook for putting on a great show, as always. We were stoked last week to have Boyd Browning and Honest Sights on, on, on Rail Talk. We were very excited to have them and to, to see them do so well. They were, they were great on the show, and it's a great 
great company that does things the right way. Just give you a couple of numbers and I'll toss it to John for his experience. Total of 153 yearlings sold during the two-day auction for a record gross of $74,780,000. Average also shattered the old record. The average was $488,758. So we're at almost $500,000 on average on yearlings at this sale. Every year, pretty much, they set a new record. Median was stayed still. The buyback rate was a little bit higher. But the big numbers that matter the most are the gross and the average. John, what did you think of the market, the atmosphere, as someone who's done this a lot more than I have? Joe, the, the atmosphere was electric. I mean, literally and 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 literally, like it felt like it was gonna it was gonna you know there was gonna be a light storm every every time they brought a new horse into the uh, into the ring, and it, people were waiting around. Um, so at other sales, like you go, you know what horses you're gonna bid on, and you get your asses out of there, you know, to try to re regroup for the next day. At that at, at that sale is such a destination site, not only for horsemen but for locals as well. That um, they actually ran out of seats, um, which I've never seen at a, at a sale before. Uh, we couldn't, you know, they, they kind of squeezed us in to get to get seats for us, but it was standing room only. There were people who were bidding from every nook and cranny on a lot of horses, and the bid spotters were literally running around like with heads on their on, on a swivel to try to make sure they got all the bids in. And it was it was amazing. It was really fun. We sold three horses on the first night um, and we're really, really pleased with, uh, you know, with the way that Fazig uh, promoted them and, and also our friends at Taylor Maid, who we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but, you know, obviously, Joe, the highlights of the uh, of the sale occurred Tuesday night um, when they had you know, the $4 million horse, uh, the, the uh, Beholder Colt, Kerlin Beholder, that Taylor made sold, and another Colt that sold for $3.2 million. And all in all, there were 10 horses that sold for a million dollars. Um, and, and it was spread out amongst, I think it was eight different buyers. So it wasn't like one guy. It wasn't like, uh, you know, you know, Bafford coming in and, and, and saying, I'm going to buy these top three um, and, and walk away. There were a lot of people that had their hands up on a lot of different horses. And that's what you hope for um, as a seller when you go to that sale, when you go to the Saratoga sale. And, and lest we forget, there's a New York bread sale coming up on Sunday and Monday as well. Um, and there's another there's going to be another like 250 or so horses that are going to go through the ring there. Um, and, and I will bet you, Joe, I'll, I'll bet you a, a, a lunch that they will break records for the New York bread sale after Monday's night is done as well. Yeah, no, and that's a, that's a, that's a growing sale for sure. Don't ever forget about the New York breads, John. We'll come for you. But yeah, I mean, it was it, it was it was a great atmosphere. You know, like I said, like we said earlier, you know, the the, the events of the weekend kind of dampered it personally. I think for some people, including ours, but that has nothing to do with facing. We put on a great show as always, and obviously the buy the the buying appetite was not lowered at all it was higher than ever the big horse obviously as you mentioned was the four million dollar curl and colt at a beholder that was a scene man if you were in the if you were in the pavilion for that the gasping because the horse reared up at one point in the yeah. ring and that didn't stop the bidding at all no no one was deterred by that um and every time the horse hit a new seven figure mark it's two million three million everybody was gasping and cheering it's a really interesting thing like, I don't know. I don't know that there are auctions like that. I mean, I guess art auctions would be the other thing. But like, other than that, there's no real equate, no, no real, you know, equal in terms of the auction world that has that kind of buzz and that kind of staying power every single year. Um, so it was it was obviously a huge night. But, John, you sold a couple of horses, as you mentioned. I'm glad I'm happy for you guys that you did well. Um, you sold them through Taylor Made. Tell us a little bit about that experience. You know, Mark Taylor was on the show, obviously, last week. Great company. They sold the topper. They can sign the topper. Tell us a little bit about the experience with Taylor made from getting to from the yearling being raised to the sale. Joe, it's a great segue. You know, we've used Taylor made for for four decades now, um, multiple generations, starting with Joe Taylor, the the the, uh, the patriarch, to Duncan Taylor um, and Frank and 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 Mark um, and Ben. You know, the uh, the other Taylor brothers are are starting to or not starting. They're more and more involved, and now the second generation, third generation, is getting more involved as well. Um, so it's a team effort there. I mean, they they you can't you can't uh, you know turn around without bumping into a Taylor. It seems like at, at a sale like that. Um, but they're, they're very, they're just really good 
sources of information. Um, you know, they have a website. So if you're selling a horse, you have a, a login. And not only can you see who looked at your horses, but you can see which vets vetted your horse out. So you have an idea of, you know, what to expect. And then you take that information and you go to, um, to one of the Taylor representatives, Taylor Farm, uh, you know, representatives, and you say, okay, we know that these five people are interested in the Uncle Mo, for example, the Uncle Mo Philly that we're selling. What do they usually buy? Like, what's their range? And those guys are on it. They knew, uh, you know, this, you know, four out of the five guys spend about a quarter of a million dollars. That's their top. And there's one guy that spends, you know, 350 to 400, but usually on Colts. And that helps us formulate exactly what kind of, um, you know, what kind of reserve we should have. And on that horse in particular, Joe, that horse sold one bid over the reserve. So from a handicapping standpoint, they nailed it perfectly. Now, the other two horses that we sold, they missed completely, but they missed on the good side because they sold for a lot more than we wanted, which, which again, is what, what you want from Taylor May. But they're very professional. Um, we love them. We've used them for years and years, and uh, I, I can't recommend them any higher than, than, uh, than saying, you know, talk to them because they, they know their shit. Yeah. No, and absolutely. And you mentioned, you know, the, the seven figure horses, West Point bought one of those. We got, we got hip 40, got a piece of hip 40 twirling candy colt, who I think is going to be a big time monster. Uh, got parts of five other, five other colts, all colts we bought this week, including two by authentic. And I, so far he is so head and shoulders above the rest of the freshman sire class, you know, just, I mean, obviously they haven't hit the track yet, but just in terms of sales results, he's so much more popular than everybody else. So I'm really excited about those two as well. Um, and there were just, there were a ton of people on the ground. It was my first experience, obviously with the sale, but you could just, I don't know, you, you could feel it, how, how stoked and, and buzzed everybody was, buzzed literally and figuratively, everybody <laughs> yeah. was for the sale because, because it, it was a hell of a time. And like you said, the New York bread sale is coming up. Um, and yeah, I expect the, the momentum to carry over to that. And then, you know, throughout the fall as well. One last major bit of business we got to get to before we get out of here today. We had a naming contest in the past couple of weeks where someone else got to pick which horse my horse, my name goes to. Like, I, it feels like that should have been part of the deal. But nevertheless, we wanted to get the audience involved and get involved, you did. We had a ton of votes. We had three, three contestants here, three finalists. We had a Munnings Colt, we had a Tom's Day Ta Colt, and we had an Entice Colt. And uh, let's let's see how they fared through the stretch here. And it's the Munnings coat up the rail with an early lead, but Tom's Day Ta's coming back at him in between horses and on the outside, and Tice is making a, lo a wide bid on the outside. The three of them are coming down, nose and nose, neck and neck, down to the final 16th, and here's the wire, John. And it's Tom's Day Ta in front. Yeah. Yeah, just barely. Yeah, just barely. I think it was literally one vote, Joe. It was one vote difference between the Tom's Data and the uh, the Munnings cult. Um, but you will forever be known as the name father of Tom's Data, Minnie Macy. We'll put the pedigree up. Um, it's actually a really solid pedigree. It's uh, it, it's from the uh, the same family as Liam's map, and not this time. Um, and the famous broodmare yada yada, which is also a New York thing, a Seinfeld thing. So it go. just really it fits. It really By fits. The, way, the name of the horse has changed in Jamaica. I should have said that off the top. But if you watch the show, you can recall that. Anyway, go ahead, John. No, it was either going to be change in Jamaica or or uh, bang in pocketbooks, one or the other. <laughs> Yeah, come on, bro. <laughs> yeah, inside joke, guys. Inside <laughs> joke. No, but no, but that that you know, I'm so stoked because I feel like this horse, you know, John was like threatening me with the Ontario bread. He's like, if I get the money, <laughs> you will never, ever, ever see him. So thanks to everybody who pushed Tom's Day Ta over the finish line there. So now I have a prayer of going to see this horse, which I will, obnoxiously so if I must and feed him peppermints and carrots and all that good stuff, whatever, whatever else horses eat. Um, so shout out to everybody who voted and shout out to everybody who retweeted. We appreciate the engagement. And do we, we haven't picked the winner yet in terms of who's going to vote for the next name, right? Because I think it wasn't part of it that someone is going to get to name a chance to name another horse. Oh, that's right. I totally forgot about that part of the contest that we're going to pick one at random. We're going to pick somebody at random who is going to name the Flame Away Min, Win Money My Honey, um, the Minnesota bread. And Patricia will put up the, uh, the pedigree on that one as well. Um, but this is the famous uh, Minnesota bread. So, you know, we'll, uh, we'll let somebody 
have carte blanche at uh, at naming a horse. Flame yeah, away, so win money, my honey. Good of us to remember how the contest worked halfway <laughs> through this segment. I, I think the contest worked actually where if you retweeted and voted, you were eligible to submit a name right. Right. for the right. panel. So yeah, all of those who retweeted, we've got your user, your what do you call that name? Your t- handle. We've got your ha- X handle. And if you voted, DM us. We'll recognize your X handle. We'll know if you're eligible or not and submit a name. And we're going to put the pedigree up right now. Thank God to Patty for clearing that up because we clearly didn't know what the rules were for the contest that we created. We created. <laughs> Good thing it wasn't sponsored, and then the sponsor would be really bad at us. Maybe the next one after this stellar performance, we'll we'll get a sponsor. Uh, the next one. I can, I can just see, I can just see our 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 report card. Joe is very, is very good in class, but he doesn't listen. <laughs> well, it wasn't just me this time. It wasn't just me. It was also you. Neither one of us listened to our own contest. Our own contest. But, I, but I like how you both said, we're going to throw this out to a random person and let them <laughs> name a horse. Uh, what random person? What, like, what? We're going to see <laughs> somebody <laughs> walking down the street and say, hey, <laughs> do you want to name this horse? <laughs> we'll find somebody on Caroline Street on Saturday. Oh. No, but we do want to reward the people who voted for this contest. So submit those names, DM us, at rail underscore talk on Twitter. Um, I'm gonna still call it Twitter, you know. Yeah, Fuck it's X. Twitter. Like, it's come Twitter. on, who's who's calling it X other than Elon Musk and his fans? Anyway, DM us on, on Twitter if you voted in the last contest and give us your submitted name for the Minnesota bread. I don't know if we have any Minnesota listeners out there, but shout out to you if you are out there and you want to see a Philly that you named at Canterbury Park. That could be you. Just DM us your favorite name. I promise this time we'll remember how the context contest works, and we'll come back in a couple weeks from now. And do a big announcement over which which name got picked for that flame away Philly. Right, John? We'll remember this, right? <laughs> so as you can see, we're a little new to the running this contest thing. But one guy that we're not new to is Len Green. And Glenn Green and the Green Group are not new to the horse business. They've been handling the taxes of some of the most important, most powerful, but also some of the regular people in racing. They've been handling their taxes for decades now, they have over 800 clients in the horse business. If you're not using Len and the Green Group, you're losing money. I can promise you that. And, you know, even if you don't, if you'll take my word for it, pop in for a consultation. I mean, don't physically go there. Just call call Len. He'll, he'll talk to you on the phone. Um, but, yeah, give leave Len a call. Give the Green Group a call. Do a one-hour consultation. I'm pretty damn sure he'll be able to save you taxes. He's done it for so many throughout this industry. And shout out to Len. We appreciated seeing him last week on the Rail Talk set. Appreciated seeing him at the sale as always. And as always, I'm happy for you guys that you did so well. Your horses ran well. You know, it was a little bit of a tough beat in the Saratoga Derby, but he ran a great race again. I'm proud of you guys for the, the sale success that you continue to have. So shout out to Len and John and everybody at the Green Group. All right, so that's going to do it for episode six of Rail Talk. We laughed, we cried. Hope you enjoyed watching. Thank you, thank you watching, listening. Thank you to all the viewers and the listeners. Shout out to John. Shout out to our producer Patty Wolf. Shout out to our associate producers, Anthony Laraca, Aliyah Laraca, and Nathan Wilkinson. I almost forgot your names because you weren't physically in front of me like you were last week. Just kidding. We love our team and we're so grateful for them. Every single episode. John's trying to do a heart right now, but it looks like he's just doing the itsy bitsy spider. But it's it's. That's the thought that counts. Um, but as always, also shout out to our sponsors, Facing Tipton, TaylorMade, and The Green Group. We hope you appreciated this, this episode. Can't wait to see you next week back here on Rail Talk. <laughs>